my pleasure to introduce the FARS president, Jerry O'Dell, to tell us more about what we're in store for this afternoon. So Jerry, if you'd like to unmute and come on back. So, oh, thank you very much, Amy. And uh, I'm so happy to see so many people here uh, this afternoon. That's great. Uh, first off, I just want to thank uh, Jenkins Arboretum for hosting this. And I especially want to thank you, Amy, for organizing this meeting. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you. I, we really, really appreciate it. I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker this afternoon. As you know, Olivia Kirkpatrick, she is the uh, Worcester Rhododendron, Rhododendron Gardener at Tyler Arboretum. And she is responsible for the maintenance, uh, the curation, and the planning design of this uh, historic uh, collection. She began at Tyler in the fall of 2019. And I have to say, she brought the perfect credentials to move this historic collection to the next level. She has a degree in landscape architecture from the University of Delaware, where she graduated the Dean's Award with the Dean's Award for Undergraduate Excellence. She also has a good solid uh, base uh, working in public, gar in public gardens. And he, she was at the Winter Tour Museum uh, Gardens and Library as the horticulture intern. And she also spent some time working down uh, in the plant records department at uh, uh, Mount Cuba Center. So I'm thrilled to really thrilled to introduce Olivia and very exci excited to hear her plans for the this wonderful rhododendron garden, what she's going to do with it. So if you'll just uh, please join me, we can't clap or anything, but uh, join me. You can do it. You can do it anyhow. But uh, uh, and welcome uh, Olivia Kirkpatrick, Tyler Arboretum's Worcester Rhododendron Garden. Thank you, uh, Olivia. Cheers. Thank you so much, Jerry, for having me. And again, thanks to Jenkins and thanks to Amy for putting this all together and providing the the Zoom expertise. I don't think I've ever done a webinar before, but it's pretty exciting. Um, and again, yeah, thank you guys. And thank you all for being here because I can't see you. I'm at full liberty to use my imagination as to what you're doing right now. I'm going to believe that some of you are baking cookies in preparation for the snow, cuddling your dogs, laying on the couch, having a great time. Um, I'm in my own home and my cat is right over there in the radiator. So if you hear any strange background noises, you can blame that on her. Um, and I'm very excited to share with you guys today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that I can present to you today. And here we go. Come on technology, there we go. So like Jerry said, I am the Worcester Rhododendron Gardener. I started in November of 2019 at Tyler. I, before that I was at Winter Tour and um, for a portion of that period of time at Tyler, I was part-time, I'm now full-time. When I was part-time, I was also working at the Mount Cuba Center. And I have my contact information down there at the bottom and I have that on my last slide as well. So if there are any questions that we don't get to in the Q&A or that you wanted a more long form answer to uh, ask me individually, please feel free to send me an email. I'm usually out in the garden, but I do get to my email periodically. So I will always do my best to answer those and to give you any more information that you might need. So just to give a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Worcester Rhododendron Garden. Um, I do use the terms Rhododendron Garden and Rhododendron Collection kind of interchangeably here because in this case they are a part of the same thing. Um, I'm going to talk about the relevance of the collection, what makes this collection notable, and one that if you're we're part of that 40% that hasn't visited, I'm going to have you convinced by the end, hopefully. Uh, we're going to talk about the composition of the collection. So again, that's just talking about what we have in the collection because it is pretty large and give you an idea of what hybridizers are represented and hybrid hybrid groups and what we have to offer at Tyler. Um, again, just talking about some of those notable collections. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities in this garden. Um, recent developments, things that I've done in my past two years at Tyler, and then our plans for 2022 and onward. And then uh, one of my favorites is rhododendron calendulaceum, so I had to include that photo there. Um, I really love this section of the garden. It's called the home garden. And it we have a lot of really beautiful hostas and grasses and things, and as well as some of our historic rhododendron in there. And I just love the way that chartreuse color that we have uh, really makes the orange pop. So I always have to show that one off. So 
just to give you a little bit of an overview of the collection. So the Wissero de Dendron Garden is about 15 acres, give or take, we're sort of expanding our bounds a little bit over time. Um, we have approximately 1500 rhododendron accessions in that collection. There are more elsewhere at Tyler. And then this represents about 486 distinct cultivars and 52 species in their selection. So massive numbers. And again, the rhododendron collection is just our rhododendrons, but the Worcester rhododendron collection is housed in the Worcester rhododendron garden. So we do have other things in the garden as well, including some large canopy trees, ground cover, and then we have other woody plants and perennials that add additional color or seasonal interest or ecological benefit, just make the whole thing as beautiful and robust as it is and beautiful in every season because we love rhododendron, but they are not blooming in January, unfortunately. Although we have had some rare exceptions where you'll get a bloom here and there when we have a warm day, which is exciting and terrifying. <laughs> and then over there on the left is just a picture of rhododendron canescens, which is another one of my favorites. All right, why are you not, there we go. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a timeline about this collection. So in 1946, John Wister became the first director at the Tyler Arboretum. He was someone who was fascinated by lots of different taxa, but rhododendron definitely was up there. Um, he started planting rhododendron in the native woodland walk in the North Woods, which are two other parts of the garden at Tyler. Those started to be planted in the 1950s. And as you can imagine, for anyone who's interested in rhododendron or just interested in public gardens and natural spaces in general, they became popular very quickly starting around Mother's Day when the bloom was at its peak. People were just flooding out there to see those beautiful collections. So based on that interest and based on Worcester's own work with rhododendron and the connections that he had, in the rhododendron community, they started uh, clearing an area that is now what we call the Worcester Rhododendron Garden in the 60s. So in 1961, the planting began there, started with the ironclads, which is a group of hardy rhododendron, and then it expanded to include lo local hybridizers, many of whom Worcester knew as colleagues and as friends. Some of those plants were transplanted from other areas of the garden or other gardens, and then we added hundreds of new cultivars during that time period. So then in the 1970s, this is exciting, the Greater Philadelphia and Valley Forge ARS chapters um, were assisting in continuing to develop the garden through new, mostly new plantings. And a lot of them were Eastern hybridizers, which is the bulk of our collection today. So moving on a little bit into the future, um, in the 80s and 90s, there was a large decline in the robustness and the health of the garden. A lot of that was due to deer browse. So at this time, uh, the Worcester Rhododendron Garden that you see today is not what you saw during that time period. The pathways and, and the garden beds were added later. So at this time, a lot of it was just mown turf and you could walk around the collection, but a lot of things were just right up to where, basically where deer could reach. They had just been deer browsed um, and the garden really starts to decline at that point. The plants can't maintain their health under those conditions. So Luckily in 2000, uh, Tyler developed a master plan that was addressing a lot of different parts of the garden. Um, deer fence was installed in the early 2000s, which really, really helped with the deer browse and helping uh, allow the collection to, to regrow and to strengthen. Uh, and then uh, specifically as a part of that master plan, Gary Smith, who you might know, he did the Enchanted Woods at Wintertour and a lot of other gardens in this area. I believe he lives in Toronto now, but for a while he was back in the area and his family was here. So he's done a lot of gardens in this area. And he did some really gorgeous designs for the rhododendron garden, um, sort of taking it, transitioning it from just a collection where again, you were really just having rhododendron plus the canopy trees and turf and then adding pathways, adding garden beds and sort of starting to um, separated into different rooms so that you know you round a corner and you see a different view and making the collection although Worcester did plant it so that things were grouped together I think that made it a lot easier to start to develop it into a garden um, what Gary Smith did was really just enhance that and again lay out where those naturalistic pathways that we have today were going to be so that's all in the early 2000s uh, the asphalt pathways were added in the early 2010s um, 2011, our wonderful Jerry O'Dell was hired part-time as the Worcester Rhododendron Gardener because the man just could not retire. He was there for a good 10 years after that, after um, selling his wonderful landscape business that he had been working on for many years. Um, 
very, Tyler was very lucky to get Jerry when they did. So Jerry was responsible for overseeing a lot of the planting in the azalea bowl, which is sort of the centerpiece of our garden and just doing a ton of garden management and keeping things healthy and overseeing plantings that were going in then. And then, like I said, I was hired in 2019 part-time. I worked with Jerry for a period of time before he officially retired. Thank you, finally. Um, and I worked at Tyler from 2019 up until last January, I was part-time. And then starting last February 1st, so it's been almost a year, I was made full-time, which that was the first time in Tyler's history that this collection had its own gardener full-time. Pretty significant. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what makes the Worcester, Worcester Rhododendron Collection unique and notable and the wonderful collection that we have today. So as you can imagine, the plants that have survived this long are really ones that are suited to this region. So if you're someone who's interested in growing things in your home garden, highly recommend coming out and just seeing what, we have some plants that are just absolutely massive. We have plants that have been here since Worcester originally planted them in the 50s and 60s, and they're just wonderful. And they were selected for that purpose too. These were plants that were either being specifically put in because we knew they were going to be successful here or because they were essentially being trialed to see if they'd be successful in this region. Um, we have a huge representation of local hybrids and local hybridizers. So we have about 70 different hybridizers represented in the Worcester Rhododendron Collection, which is just incredible. And it's great to see their work represented, you know, before that specific hybridizer to see sort of the body of their work, but also to compare it to other gardeners because a lot of them were communicating with one another, working together. And as I start to talk about the collection, you really are going to see um, sort of the extent to which these people were communicating with one another and working with one another and advancing each other's work. And on that note, we do have some pretty extensive and unique collections from certain hybridizers. Some of these plants don't exist in any other public gardens and may not even exist in private gardens. I'm sure any of you who are familiar with rhododendron know, or with any taxa, uh, it can be really difficult to access private records like that. So some of these plants, to our knowledge, only exist at Tyler and they may not exist anywhere else. And then over there on the right, we'll see a lovely photo of Dr. John Wister himself um, with what I believe is a truss of rhododendron flowers, although it's a little bit hard to tell with the quality of the image. So I just wanted to read a quote from him. This is from a report that he wrote in 1966 that talks a little bit about the goals of the Wister Rhododendron Garden. So again, just to read that out loud to you. The goal of the Worcester Rhododendron Garden is to present in an orderly way as many possible representatives of the different series, species, and hybrids of rhododendron and azalea to give a long season of bloom and attractive color harmony that would inspire more and better rhododendron and azalea planting in the Philadelphia area, and that it would be used by expert growers for series study. So again, things that I was highlighting as being notable about this collection really does. Um, that's what Worcester set out to do, and I think what we're continuing to do today. So it is, we have huge representations of different series and, and collections by hybridizers. It's just a gorgeous garden in general. Highly recommend coming any time of year as someone who's out there year round. I think it's gorgeous all times. I think winter actually might be one of my favorite uh, seasons for the Worcester Rhododendron Garden, but the color harmony that you see there because it's grouped by hybridizer in many cases, you can see someone's sort of niche, you can see they were trying to get toward red or they were trying to get toward a blush color. Just really gorgeous. And again, inspiring more and better rhododendron and azalea planting in this area. If you take nothing else away from this, go plant a nice azalea or rhododendron in your yard if you have space. Come to Tyler and pick out which ones you like and see if you can get them um, in the trade because they are wonderful plants and they really can be very well suited to this area. And then again, using by expert growers for series study, anyone who's interested in rhododendron in any way, I communicate with ARS members fairly regularly. And if there's any information that we can provide or cuttings or seed, anything that we can do for you guys, that's what we're here for. So just to talk a little bit more about the composition of the collection. So I included the map that I put together there on the left, just to give you an idea of some of the major collections and where they were located. So you can see Tyler's under that blue dot in the middle. Swarthmore is right basically on top with this uh, quality of map. So those are overlapped there, but basically spreading out sort of in a radius there. We have plants from as far north as the Dexter hybrids from Cape Cod, as far west as uh, Tony Shamarello's hybrids from Ohio, as far south as some of the Glendale hybrids from Maryland. 
So the collection itself is composed of azalea and rhododendron species. We have a lot of different hybridizers and hybrid groups, including the Glendale azaleas, gable hybrids from Pennsylvania, Swarthmore hybrids right nearby from uh, Swarthmore area, Shamarella hybrids from Ohio, nearing hybrids, which were in New Jersey, Dexter hybrids up in Cape Cod, the iron clouds, which were selected specifically from Boston and that surrounding area, but they are suited to this whole region. Um, the Boers hybrids up from the Ithaca area, and then other European and American hybrids. Um, we have a pretty broad collection of those. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the specific hybridizers and hybrid groups that we have in the collection that I think are pretty notable and give you a good idea of sort of the, the breadth of the collection that we have. So we do have a lot of Dexter hybrids. I think this is the most extensive collection that we have. And I am just a huge fan. The, the areas of the Worcester Rhododendron Gardener that are full of Dexter hybrids are just gorgeous. They, I think the plants not only have gorgeous bloom, but the structure of the plants is just really wonderful. And because a lot of them are older, they just like beautiful and old and gnarled. And I just adore them. I could talk about it forever. So these are plants that were hybridized by Charles Owen Dexter, uh, who lived from 1862 to 1943. He did a lot of his hybridizing at Shami Farms, which is now Heritage Museums and Gardens in Sandwich, Massachusetts. He was breeding for hardiness, clear, bright colors, fragrance, bl big blossoms, which as you can see from Rhododendron Acclaim there on the left, he really did achieve a lot of that. The color, I, I put Acclaim in there because it really is one of my favorites. You, you don't see color like that in many rhododendrons. It's just gorgeous. I probably stared at that for a good 10 minutes that day. I took so many photos of it. And one of the interesting things about the Dexter hybrids and part of the reason why we have so many is that unfortunately when Dexter passed away in 43 a lot of his uh, plants hadn't been they weren't being preserved some of the land was sold pretty quickly and they were basically at risk of being lost and Dr. Wister our very first director here at Tyler who's the one that put this collection together he actually spearheaded um, sort of a focus group that went out and collected Dexter's plants from his old property and from other gardens in the area to assemble them at Tyler and at other collections nearby just to make sure that we didn't lose these incredibly valuable plants which not only are they valuable in their own right but a lot of hybrids have been hybridized off of Dexter's using his as the parent plant whether it was um, seed or pollen parent. Um, we have at least 282 accessions in the collection might even be more than that. I don't remember when I got that number but that was the number that I had. Um, and then again, we have a lot of original Dexter hybrids, but we also have a lot of hybrids that were hybridized off of Dexter's hybrids, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later as well. And then this just talk a little bit more about the Dexter hybrids, but also specifically how Tyler can be used as a resource and essentially any public garden can be used as a resource. So Heritage Museums and Gardens, which is Charles Dexter's former estate, um, it is now a public garden. I did have the opportunity to visit this summer, which is pretty wonderful. They hired uh, Lorraine Washburn as an independent contractor on a grant to assemble information on Dexter and his hybrids and then just start to repatriate those hybrids back to heritage. So they reached out, they looked at all the records online for public gardens, reached out to different collections where they knew Dexter hybrids were located and assembled a list of the plants that they didn't have there. And then they were able to reach out to those gardens, including Tyler, and essentially ask us to assess which ones they could come and take cuttings of. So that list was sent to myself and sent, it was actually sent to Jerry as well. I know he got to see all of that. It was fascinating. So sent to myself, sent to Allison, who's our plant recorder. And then she and I took that list, mapped those plants out, and were able to go out in the gardens and tag them so that we could find them later, but also assess whether or not they were healthy enough for cutting. So that's a lot of what I did last winter was just, especially we had all that snow, I would just trudge up the hill at Tyler with my little clipboard. All my notes are like completely water stained from like putting my clipboard down in the snow, but I was able to assess those plants and say, this one's really healthy. This one definitely has some stuff at the crown that we could take cuttings of. We actually couldn't locate this one. So it gave us a good opportunity to do some more plant records work there. And then over there on the right, that is an image that I actually took when I was at Heritage with the little cuttings prepped and stuck in there. So Lorraine was able to visit Tyler in July. She had collected cuttings of over 50 plants at Tyler, as well as Winter Tour, cutting fields near Botanic Gardens, other gardens in the area. Um, 
and there were a lot of um, cultivars of Dexters that weren't actually available at anywhere else. So the ones that were specifically only at Tyler were included Adelphia, Hatchfield, Hatchville, Lady of Wakefield, Lady of Winfield, Megansett, Sir James, and Zest. So these are plants that were only located at Tyler. And had we not maintained our collection to the extent that we were able to, those might not have been available when Heritage went looking for them and when people who are interested in Dexter went looking for them. So there's me over there on the right. I did get to visit Heritage in August. Um, I got a tour of their property. I was on vacation and I did drag my best friend around with me. It was quite hot that day and I was just like, fully entranced by these gorgeous rhododendron in this beautiful garden. So if you are someone who's interested in rhododendron, you haven't been up there, I highly recommend it. It's gorgeous. Um, rhododendron just grow beautifully up there. So it's, it's wonderful to see. And because I was able to make that trip after meeting Lorraine and meeting some of the other staff there, that just forms an even stronger bond. Um, we got to talk about which plants they have at Heritage that we don't have at Tyler. I will be able to get cuttings from them if I need them, if they have, you know, rooted cuttings already that they don't need. I might be someone that they could contact about that, which is really wonderful. Um, and again, because I had this connection with them when I went in to say, thank you for giving me a tour. I had a wonderful visit. I found out that there were a few cuttings of theirs that didn't make it, whether they were less robust or whatever. Um, so I mailed them some additional cuttings in September. So that is, um, one of the benefits of having such a wonderful collection here at Tyler is that uh, it's not only beautiful for our visitors to come and see and for our gardeners to care for, it can also be a wonderful resource for other gardens and anyone who's interested in rhododendron. So next I'm going to talk about the Gable hybrids. These were hybridized by Joseph Gable in the Stewartstown, Pennsylvania area. Um, really love Gable for this. He was really breeding rhododendron that were going to survive those tough Pennsylvania winters which we've seen off and on for the past few years, for sure. Um, he was, one of his tactics was just sort of to plant things out in the woods and check on them in a couple years. And if they survived, they were tough. He wasn't babying them, which I do appreciate. Um, and we do have 20 of the Gable hybrids over there on the left is Conawago, which is an earlier blooming one. And you can just look at the, it, those flowers are prolific. It's just massive, beautiful, um, and definitely, after a long cold winter, you look forward to seeing your Conawago blooming. Next, I'm gonna talk about the Nearing hybrids. So these were hybridized by Guy Nearing in Ridgewood, New Jersey, as well as a little bit in Delaware. As a Delaware uh, native and resident myself, was always happy to hear that. So these were bred for beauty and hardiness in tougher New Jersey area climates. Um, some of the sets that you might be familiar with, if you're familiar with Nearing, are the Guy and Court set. Um, for example, Monchanan. So these were the ones that were hybridized in Delaware when he had a nursery there that was later um, absorbed by a larger nursery. Um, so all of those are named after. There's a Monchanan, there's a Hocassin. And again, as a Delaware person, I found that very exciting. Um, and then he also has a set of Carolinianum hybrids. Um, Windbeam and Wyanoki are two of those, and we do have those at Tyler. So we do have seven nearing hybrids, two of which are nearing gable hybrids. So again, like I said earlier, a lot of these hybridizers were colleagues, but also friends, and we're working with one another, sending cuttings back and forth, asking each other questions, seeing where people had had success or struggles, and helping one another where they could. So again, two nearing gable hybrids, and we have two nearing reed hybrids as well. And then the list is down there. And the photo there on the left is a, a photo of Monchanan. Um, another notable collection we have here at Tyler are the Glendale hybrids. So, so these were hybridized by Ben Morrison at the USDA Plant Introduction Station in Glendale, Maryland. Uh, these were, the purpose of this breeding program was to breed large flowered, large flowered landscape azaleas that would be winter hardy in Washington, DC, provide blooms all the way April through June. Um, this program began in the 1920s, lasted 25 years, and can you believe this, resulted in 454 new evergreen azalea cultivars. Um, you can still get these in nurseries today. They're, they're quite successful and pretty prolific as well. Um, and we do have 64 of the Glendale azaleas. A lot of them are planted, if you've been to Tyler, kind of coming up the slope from the pond, a lot of them are planted in that area. Um, this is rhododendron modesty, and I stole this joke from Jerry, but what is modest about that plant? Look at her, she's just gorgeous. Um, love that bright, rich pink, um, very clear color as well, as you can see. The ironclad, so this is not a hybrid group by a specific hybridizer. If you're not familiar, these are 
a list of reliably winter hardy rhododendrons selected by E.H. Wilson, this British plant collector. Um, and these specifically, when I was speaking about Boston earlier, um, Wilson was the associate director at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. Um, so he was picking plants that were hardy up there. And, um, you know, Pennsylvania can be cold, Delaware can be cold, but Boston can be quite cold. So these are some really hardy plants. Um, and for the longest time, um, these really were considered the backbone of any rhododendron collection. Um, we do have 10, depending on who you ask and depending what year a publication is from, the number of ironclads kind of varies. But we're gonna say it was 14 original um, ironclad rhododendron of which we have 10. Um, and a lot of them are still doing really well. Um, I keep a close eye on them because I'm a big fan personally and because I think it's really wonderful that we were able to maintain that many of the original 14. Um, we have two, all right, three that we never had in the collection and then two that have uh, struggled over the years and have been lost, but they are pretty wonderful. They have beautiful blooms, but again, they're just big and hardy and just happy to keep growing even in tougher winters. And then I, the next one that I wanna talk about are pretty special specifically to Tyler. So these are the Swarthmore, the Wister hybrids. So these were bred by Tyler's director, um, Dr. John Wister at Tyler and at the Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College, where he was also director. Can you imagine being director at two different gardens? Incredible, this man, very hardworking, clearly, very dedicated, clearly. Uh, you just love to see it. So a lot of these plants he was breeding actually to try to coincide with uh, Swarthmore College's graduation ceremony, which didn't happen until July. and now happens, I believe in June. So it's a little bit less relevant, but I just love that single-minded passion that he had of like, when we have parents and people coming in from out of town to see these graduate graduating seniors, we want to have rhododendron blooming for them. I love I love hearing the motivation behind people's um, breeding programs. So a lot of these were again because Worcester collected the Dexter hybrids. A lot of these were hybridized off of Dexter hybrids, and we we have decent records on that. A lot of the records for the Dexter hybrids were lost, so we're not sure necessarily what those Dexter hybrids were hybridized from originally, but from that point and from the numbering system we have for De the Dexter hybrids, we can see what some of these Swarthmore hybrids were hybridized from. And then over there, a lot of these Swarthmore hybrids were never registered, so they're still under breeder's code. So if you see a rhododendron at Tyler with a tag that says rhododendron SW and then a number, that is indicating that it's a Swarthmore hybrid plant. So the next thing I want to do is just talk a little bit about some of the challenges on opportunities in the garden. Um, looking at the photo there on the right, you can see that dandelions were a challenge this past year. Um, but again, just it's a wonderful garden. And I think there are so many opportunities that definitely outweigh the challenges. But the challenges are present. And I think they are worth talking about because some of them are specific to Tyler, but a lot of them are challenges that we're seeing in any public or private garden at this time. So. Some of the challenges, we do have full-time staffing, which is incredible. Um, as of this past year, again, it's almost been a full 12 months since we, I was made full-time and the collection had its first full-time gardener, but I am only one staff member and I do get assistance from my colleagues, but they care for the whole rest of the Arboretum. So they have plenty of work to do without me, you know, nudging them for, hey, can you help me out with this project today? It's, it's big and it's just me. Um, so when you do the math, if I work 37 and a half hours a week and I take care of 15 acres, that's only two and a half hours per acre per week, which anyone who gardens knows is not enough time. I mean, you could give me infinite hours per acre and I could still tell you I needed more time. So again, that is kind of a challenge, but also an opportunity as well. Um, we do have weed pressure in the garden. Anyone does, whether it's uh, weed from, weeds from adjacent properties or weeds from our own property, birds, I don't know. You're always gonna have weeds on any on any property, but it's definitely can be tough, especially without fully established ground cover to keep those under control. Um, invasive pressure is another big one. We see new invasives every year, um, regardless of who you talk to in the industry or even people who garden at home. You're gonna see bittersweet, you're gonna see honeysuckle. Um, and some of those can be really challenging to manage, especially with limited staffing. Um, another big one in our garden is stormwater management has definitely been a challenge, especially as um, the climate has continued to change and stormwater patterns continue to change. So 
the whole garden is kind of shaped like a bowl with the azalea bowl in the center. So we do see water sort of sheeting off the meadow that's adjacent to us or the pinetum and some of those flatter areas with less um, dense root systems. We see a lot of that water coming right into the Worcester rhododendron garden. And again, if you know rhododendron, they do not like wet feet. It makes them really prone to fungal infection. And there are some areas where we've lost some big old plants just because, you know, you make one tiny change up at the top and by the time the water gets to the bottom, it's a massive difference. So that's definitely been a challenge that we've been dealing with. And Tyler does have a stormwater management plan that's going to be going into effect quite soon. So a lot of those are going to be addressed, but it's a worthy challenge to, to mention there. Um, I know it broke Jerry's heart when some of the old scintillations had to be removed. Those were just beautiful hybrid uh, rhododendron, massive. And from what we can tell, because they were right on the edge of a swale and we had all that water coming in there, their roots were just staying too wet and they succumbed to Phytophthora or other fungal infections. Um, and sort of related to that, climate challenges is definitely a big one. Our summers have changed, our winters have changed. Um, we will have a period of warmth followed by a cold snap and that can be really challenging. You can lose bloom that way, um, but it's also just really hard on the plant and that stress can definitely affect um, weaker plants that are younger or ones that are older and starting to decline. Um, it's definitely a challenge and I know everyone's dealing with that everywhere, but worthy, worthy of mentioning here. And again, somewhat related to the stormwater management, there's always a risk of fungal infections. And when you do have a collection that's composed of one specific taxa. If it's an if it's an illness uh, or a fungal infection or whatever that affects or insect, whatever it happens to be, it, if it if it affects one rhododendron, it's likely to affect another. So having them so closely packed together, although we've been careful to do pruning to maximize airflow and to keep them as healthy as possible, they are all rhododendron. And if they're if one of them is susceptible to some sort of um, illness, the others are going to be susceptible as well. So we do have to keep an eye on that. And then again, this is an aging collection. We have added new plants, but we started planting these in the 1950s and 60s. So we're definitely seeing some plants where they're in decline now and you can't blame them. They're, they're quite old and plants can, can keep growing for a long time, but sometimes they, especially with rhododendron having a fairly shallow root system, sometimes you'll see older plants topple over or they just start to slowly decline. So that's the depressing part of my of my lecture, um, some of the challenges that we see there, but I think all of them translate really well to opportunities. So again, we have full-time staffing. After years and years and years of only part-time staffing, we do have a full-time staff member now. And being out there every day, I have seen it make a difference. I have had so much more time to commit to curation of the collection, thinking about future development and it, it's been wonderful. I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, again, we are in a beautiful natural setting. The garden itself is gorgeous, but we're surrounded by the rest of Tyler's property. We're backed up to the wood on one edge. That's just gorgeous. I mean, I could just, I mean, I do essentially, I could just sit out there all day and listen to the birds. It's just beautiful. Um, again, the size of the garden, 15 acres is massive. A 15 acre rhododendron collection is almost unheard of. Um, it's wonderful. Like I said, it is, we do have a very notable one of a kind collection. There are plants in our collection that you're not going to see anywhere else. We have plenty of areas that are still to be, to be developed from a collection to a garden. So again, continuing with Gary Smith's plan to turn these more into garden rooms and create distinct feelings and collections. We still have plenty to do with that. And, and the more development that we do there, the better the garden looks. And something that I'll talk about a little bit later that may make this comment make a little more sense, but we do have some adjacent space that's still available for development. Um, Tyler's property is, is fairly large and some of the borders from the Worcester Rhododendron Garden to the Pinetum, um, there's some space there that we can still work on developing. This is just a very nice view. Um, and again, to show you that there is seasonal interest, um, even outside of the rhododendron bloom season. So these are some Tatarian asters and then a uh, Lindira slicifolia, so a, a willow leaf uh, space bush. One of my favorite views there in the fall. Again, um, just to talk a little bit about what we've been doing the past few years. In 2021, this number blows my mind. Math is incredible. Uh, we incre increased staff hours by 250% by making me full-time from part-time. Previously, I was working two days a week at 15 hours a week. 
Now I'm working 37 and a half as a full-time staff member. So just to talk a little bit about the garden in 2021, um, a lot of what I did was management and starting to get into some planning for the future. Um, we kept up with garden maintenance and invasive removal and continuing to clear some areas that had been a little bit overtaken because again, we are adjacent to a meadow and to the pine needum and then the woods. You're gonna get invasives. It's the nature of the world. Um, so we did a lot of invasive removal and just keeping up with garden maintenance. So for me, that's spraying, hand pulling, sending my volunteers and telling them to go wild and pull out as much honeysuckle as they want. Um, that's definitely a big portion of the time that we spend in the garden. We did remove and deaccession over 55 dead rhododendron. So this is making the garden more aesthetically pleasing. Nobody wants to look at a, a dead rhododendron. I mean, I kind of do. They're still pretty beautiful. Um, <laughs> it provides us some data on plant loss so we can say lost a lot of plants in these areas or lost a lot of plants from this specific year or lost a lot of plants that are this specific cultivar. This one might not do as well here. So that gives us a lot of data that we can use in the future to either keep an eye on plants in the collection or that are gonna determine what we're adding and not adding back to the collection. And then again, anything we take out, we're just clearing more space to either replace those things if it makes sense to replace them or if we're able to, or start to add some new hybrids that fit in with the mission of the garden. Um, again, we, were, we did some assessing and evaluating different parts of the collection um, with the goal of creating a more detailed collection policy that's gonna help guide um, future development of the garden we ordered and planted $1,000 worth of perennials, very exciting. And we did some clearing and assessing of some of the stormwater management infrastructure in the garden. Um, I did have my volunteers um, clearing out uh, that we have pervious asphalt and then there are gabion baskets underneath where the water is gonna flow through a squale. So I had to make them move with me all of these rocks out of the way, clear out those gabion that had gotten clogged with sediment and then put all the rocks back. So we said we were doing stonework, but it's just, I would take them out there and have them just pick up rocks and put them back. Um, it was pretty fun. <laughs> um, just to talk a little bit about the planting that we did this year, $1,000 is a relatively low budget. So with that money, we wanted to make a pretty high impact. Um, so we wanted to choose areas with relatively low weed pressure so that we could maintain them fairly easily while they were getting established and not dedicate too, too much of my limited time there and too much of our volunteers limited time there. Um, and then we wanted them to be invisible in high traffic areas so they can make as much of an impact as possible. So you can see some of my little iPad doodles there. Again, you can see the landscape architecture degree um, rearing its head. I had, I had to sketch it out so I could visualize it. Um, so the first planting of the two that I decided to do with this money um, is the doorway. So those of you have been at, who've been at um, Tyler probably will recognize this doorway. This was a part of an installation years ago that has remained in the garden. Um, it's a doorway, but there's not a path going through it, or at least an asphalt path going through it. Um, and you can't tell people not to walk through a doorway. It's, it's natural. You can see in the photo there on the left, that sort of desire line where people have been walking through. So that ground was pretty compacted. People were walking through there. And then again, there on the left, there were some older, unfortunately deceased, uh, Worcester hybrid plants, um, some of the Swarthmore hybrids. So we ended up taking those out and doing some planting there. And then um, my coworkers helped me put in just a temporary mulch path there where we, while we think about what kind of um, path material we wanna use in the future. So again, it was a pretty simple planting. Uh, the nice thing about working in this garden is that I can see what perennials have done well in other areas. So when I'm adding new plants, sometimes it's great to add a few experimental ones to see how they do, but I can also sort of add a backbone there of plants that I know do really well. So the Carex plantaginia that you can see there on the bottom of that photo. We have that planted elsewhere and it does beautifully. I love that plant. Um, so I knew it was going to do well in this area of the garden. So I, I was able to add a decent amount of that. Um, we added some additional hosta, Komodo dragon hybrid, which is one that gets massive, which we love. Um, again, the Carex, Carex plantaginia, um, Heuchera plum pudding for that purple that you see there right by the doorway. Um, Lady in red, fern. Um, Wood Aster, a cultivar called Eastern Star, Tiarella Running Tapestry, which is more of a running um, Tiarella. And then there was some Rudbeckia in the area already, so we just kind of echoed that on the other side, uh, adding some of those. Uh, the other planting that we did 
This year was, I'm calling the entrance. So this is the first entrance if you're on the scenic loop at Tyler. This is the first entrance off the scenic loop. So it's very visible. The sign there on the left on that left photo introduces you to the rhododendron garden. And as you can see on the photo on the lower right, um, it was pretty massively overgrown. There was some poison ivy in there. Mercifully, I am not allergic. So I did pull that out and sprayed it. Um, and then there are these large um, rhododendron maximum that were again, unfortunately dead and we did remove them, but that created this whole new area for planting. So again, a lot of these are repeats from the previous planting just to carry that rhythm through the garden. So some of the Komodo dragon hosta, Carex, Heucra, Lady in Red Fern, Eastern Star, Aster, that Tiarella, and then we added some Echinacea um, right around the corner from this portion of the garden. If you were to enter off to your right, there is going to be what we call the home garden. And there's some really wonderful Echinacea in there. And I love the color that they provide as well as uh, because they're sort of a summer blooming plant once the azalea are just about done, the rhododendron are just about done. It's nice to have that pop of color. So we added those. Um, and then the next thing that I wanted to talk about is sort of our plans for the next year and the years moving forward. I've divided these kind of into three categories to make it a little bit easier to talk about. This is how I have it in my head as well. So I actually have notes above my desk, it's sheets of paper where I can scribble down my ideas and they have these headers. So the headers that I have for this are management. So continuing to maintain the garden, curation, keep an eye on the collection, as well as development. So adding new areas, adding new, um, developing the areas that we already have, etc. cetera. Um, and then the photo here, this is a view of the Azalea Bowl in May, 2020. Um, I know that the pandemic has been hard on everyone. Hope everyone is doing okay, just on an aside there. Um, but Tyler's staff, a lot of our staff was furloughed at the beginning of the pandemic, myself included. Um, I kept myself very busy at home, gardening, doing various crafts, but it was so sad not to be at Tyler during the bloom season or at least the beginning of the bloom season. And as you can see, the weeds got just out of control. So that's something that we're still coping with now. So again, back to management being that first header for our plans for 2022 and onward. Management to me is just continue to maintain the health and appearance of the garden. So again, any management technique that you can think of, we do here. So weeding, spraying, mulching, pruning and deadwooding and keeping those plants healthy, removing debris. Again, we have lots of these large canopy trees, especially the tulip poplars are dropping branches and dropping limbs, keeping, thing, keeping on top of that for safety and for aesthetics, um, continuing to remove invasives as they start to invade, and then continuing to clear the pathways and keep things accessible and um, as aesthetically pleasing as possible. Um, again, for plants for 2022, Curation is one of the big things that we're interested in continuing, continuing to do. Um, this is where my brief background in plant records has definitely been an asset. Um, just being able to do mapping and work with our database and have a good understanding of how to um, curate and keep track of records for the collection. So continuing to monitor plants in the collection is a big uh, thing that we need to continue to do. This is to ensure their good health, ensure their longevity, keep an eye on them. If there's an intervention that we need, that gives us the information we need to be able to do that. And then there are some plants that again, they're gonna to continue to, to decline, whether that's just because they're aging out or they're having a disease, fungal issue, insect, whatever it happens to be. Um, if we keep a close eye on them and we do use our plant records um, effectively and efficiently, we can send those out to be propagated as we need to. And we have definitely done a lot of that. Um, and are continuing to do that. One of my goals is to develop a collection, poli collection policy and a management guide for the garden, just to establish some guidelines for care, the health of the collection, and then the future development, just to make sure that we're keeping aligned with Worcester's original mission and, and Tyler's mission as an organization. Um, and as I mentioned before, a lot of the hybrids that we have in the collection were never registered. So they're still labeled with breeders codes and a lot of them are just ripe to be registered plants so that they are given their unique cultivar names and they could be added to the trade at some point. Um, and we have a lot of data on them about bloom color and time and structure of the plant. So that's just something that once we have a little more free time, we are hoping to do that. And then development. So this is just continuing to grow the garden, whether that is developing areas that we already have in the garden, adding new areas, um, adding additional portions to the collection or expanding collections that we already have, 
So some of the plans we have upcoming are continuing to plant out the azalea bowl, which again is this um, section of the garden that is kind of the centerpiece. It blooms in a cascade starting at white at the top and finishing with red at the bottom. Um, a lot of beautiful evergreen azaleas in there. So just continuing to plant that out to fit that cascade of bloom and then to add some ground cover in there as well for aesthetics and to complement the bloom, but also to reduce some of the maintenance needs in that area because it is quite sunny and the weeds love to grow there. There's some patches of mugwort that I have just been like absolutely duking it out with. And again, with volunteer help, one of the things, if you ever have free time and want to volunteer at Tyler, um, send me an email and I can connect you with the appropriate people. We rely very heavily on our volunteers and they are just wonderful people. Love to have a relationship with them. So I say here with the volunteers help, um, just continue to tackle some of that invasive removal in some areas. I wanna get all the bittersweet out of the rhododendron. I would love to see some areas cleared and developed in the future. Um, finish plantings at the entrance and the doorway that we just talked about. Continue to clear and um, plant the native room, which is another garden room in the collection as well as some other areas. Um, something that I had not mentioned previously is that we do have a nursery in the rhododendron collection. It's kind of up farther from our visitor center, um, one of the farther corners of the collection. But this is just a lot of plants that have been um, planted in rows to get them to a size where they're able to be planted out. And a lot of them are getting a little bit too big. And we have plenty of them to continue to move out. A lot of them were propagated from cuttings and are um, can be replacements for some plants that have aged out or that have, you know, a, a tree branch fell on them or they succumb to some sort of fungal issue. Um, so just continuing to plant those out. And then we also have some plants in our shade house that are things that I've gotten from colleagues or that Jerry or other ARS members have very generously donated. So we have a lot of plants that still need to be planted. And again, it's all about making time for that and, and making a plan. And then continuing to add additional specimens and garden areas in alignment with the mission. So adding individual plants, but also adding garden areas and um, new collections to our greater collection that we have here at Tyler. So some another exciting thing that we do have coming up in 2022 and onward, um, we were granted $10,000 by the Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust. And this is intended to be used for continuing to plant the azalea bowl, so this is phase three of our plans for the uh, rhododendron garden. Um, Tyler has invested a lot of money. Uh, we have had money contributed other years by Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust. So that is just a massive chunk of money that we're so grateful for um, to, stand, to the Horticultural Trust themselves, but also to Tyler's other staff members who can um, assist in grant writing for that. So we're very grateful to have that. You can see over there on the left as I'm starting to scheme about what plants we need, which have been successful and unsuccessful in the bowl, and what our plan is there. And then another thing that I wanted to talk about that is so exciting, um, we are actually adding another area to the garden at the Worcester Rhododendron Garden. Um, we're calling it the Modern Hybridizers Garden. Um, and I think the collection has just been calling out for this for years. So like I said, when I was talking about the composition of our collection here, a lot of them are local hybridizers, but because a lot of the planting stopped, we did a massive amount of planting in the 60s and into the 70s and 80s, but it really slowed down after that. So ARS members, I'm sure you're all familiar. There are still uh, hybridizers out there doing their wonderful hybridizing work. And there are so many plants, we've got some wonderful yellows that are not present in the collection. Um, and we would just love to be able to represent the work that's continuing to happen and that has happened since, since the 1960s, um, it, represent that in the garden. So the goal for this, this is a partnership between Tyler and District 8, so that's you guys, um, Greater Philadelphia Valley Forge and Lehigh Valley. Um, the goal is to display at Tyler rhododendrons that have been hybridized, named, or registered, and or registered by current and past local and regional hybridizers. So again, it's sort of that radius that I was showing on that original map. So the, you know, Eastern, Eastern US, Mid-Atlantic region um, with that radius extending about 150 miles from Tyler. And then the goal of this garden once it is installed is to just continue to assess these hybrids um, based on their performance. Some of them have been planted in, you know, private gardens, but have not been planted in public gardens. So we're going to continue to assess them 
leave the superior specimens, start to cull the ones that aren't doing as well, and just continue to plant things out. So not only is this providing a service to be able to tell which plants give a little bit more data on which ones are successful, but also Tyler visitors are going to be able to see these and see the work that local hybridizers have continued to do, um, you know, in the years since we since we did our initial plantings um, and not see what plants they might be interested in adding to their own yards, because some of these hopefully will be added to the trade at some point. And then again, I just want to run through, I wish that I could have put about a million photos in here, but I didn't want to keep you guys for too long. And I wanted to give you time to ask questions if you had them, but even with the weeds that you can see in this photo here, again, this was taken right after um, the period of time where our staff was furloughed. So I hadn't been in the garden for about three months at this point. You can see there are a lot of weeds, but gosh darn it, if the, the color of that bloom doesn't just still completely outweigh, even when we do have some higher weed pressure and invasive pressure. Um, this is another photo of what we call the home garden. So you can see that calendulaceum in the background there. It's just a beautiful garden and a beautiful collection year round. Again, no rhododendron blooming at this time, but you can see that Tatarian aster in the background. Um, and just the structure of the garden is beautiful year round. And I could not resist, like I said, the Dexter hybrids are one of my favorites and uh, the structure of the plants is just gorgeous. This was last year in the snow, right after I um, started working here full time. Um, this is what it was like when I was walking around um, doing some assessments for cuttings that we were going to send to Heritage, um, just me tromping around in the snow, um, being distracted by how gorgeous the Dexter collection is. And again, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to Jerry for um, inviting me to speak. Thank you to Amy and Jenkins for hosting. Um, I had to include this photo here. This is me standing next to uh, Rhododendron Duke of York. Look how massive that plant is. You can, you can barely see me in there because I always wear green, but just this wonderful, massive plant. I am so grateful to work at Tyler and to be able to work with these gorgeous plants. When I started here, I had some background in Rhododendron from working at, at um, Winter Tour and working at other public gardens, but I have just learned so much and the IRS has definitely been a part of that. Um, I just want to thank all the members there as well for always being willing to share your knowledge and communicate with me. Um, and again, I have my contact information down there in the bottom left. Um, you can also find my email on Tyler's website if you ever have any questions. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and again, thank you. And um, I'll be here to answer questions that you guys have. So Amy and Jerry are going to help me out with that. Um, so if you have any questions, you can put those. Um, there's the, the um, Q&A function down at the bottom. So thank you guys. Thank you, Olivia. That was awesome. Great to, to see what you guys are up to at Tyler. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as Olivia mentioned again, um, there is the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. Um, so if you guys want to ask any questions, we'll give you a moment or two to write some things down and we'll pass those along to Olivia. Take advantage of it. Ask me any question you want. <laughs> may, I, may I, can I ask one? Uh, I just, uh, Olivia, that was a fabulous uh, presentation. And I, 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 it's incredible what you've done in the two years you've been here, especially with the pandemic and the, you know, not being able to get all your hours in there, the volunteers and everything. It's just, it's just really, uh, I'm very, very impressed. You're doing a great job. Thank so, you. I, I do have one one question. I know it's a, uh, do you have, uh, have you just, you know, the, the time you've been here, have you uh, uh, gotten a, do you have a favorite rhododendron yet? That's such a good question. I mean, it changed, it's changed every bloom season so far. Um, something interesting about me, I've had like such a love-hate relationship with orange for a long time, especially when I was doing landscape design. I was like, get rid of those orange plants. I don't want to see them. But now I'm kind of fond of them. So again, that mandarin red calendulaceum that's in the home garden is one of my favorites. It's just the orange just kind of glows, but the Dexter hybrids are another favorite of mine. That acclaim that's like that bright, almost red. It's just so gorgeous. I could probably talk about that forever. I love so many of those plants. And again, something will bloom and I'll have seen it a hundred times. And one day I'll just stop and stare at it. And I'm like, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. I could stay in this garden all day. Great. 
So we have had a couple questions uh, populate while you were answering that one. So there's a question here. How can we attract younger gardeners to rhododendrons? And second part of that, is there any plan to market or sell successful hybrids? That is a wonderful question as um, I'm 25, which does put me in the, the younger gardeners group, I think still. Technically, I am not a Gen Z, I am a millennial, but I still think I count. Um, it's such a good question. I think a lot of it, there was like this huge heyday for rhododendron as starting in the 20s and onward where a lot of these plants were being brought over from Asia and from Europe and hybridizing them with the hybrids that we have here um, or the species that we have here. But it's just a really wonderful question. I think a lot of it comes down to the connections that we have um, in the industry, making sure that things are making it into the nursery trade. Because a lot of them, a lot of the plants that we have at Tyler, you're not going to be able to get in the trade anywhere. Um, I'm not a hybridizer myself, so I don't know that I have the best answer for that. But I think it's a really good question and something that we should continue to consider. Um, if you are a rhododendron person, just talk to young people about it as another recommendation of mine. I don't know if you've seen a rhododendron, I don't know how you could be obsessed with them. They're just wonderful plants. And so I apologize for not having a better answer for that. But for me, the answer was get a job at Tyler and start working with them. <laughs> All right. So here's another question. Um, someone's asking, we lost a new rhododendron to wood borers. Has Tyler had that problem too? And do you know how to get rid of them? So again, that's wood borers. Oh, not the easiest word to say. <laughs> <laughs> wood borers. Um, we, not to my knowledge, we've had too much of an issue with them at Tyler, but that's one where if you want to send me an email, I can send you some information on how to deal with different pest issues. I do have some wonderful books and publications um, that can answer that better than I can. Because again, it's not an issue that I've personally dealt with, but I know that there are, um, there's literature out there for how to deal with that. Okay. Great. You have had two accolades come through. Amazing presentation, terrific presentation. Um, part two of this one person's question is, are there plans for Tyler to start propagating or doing public plant sales from cuttings of the collection? That is another really great question. Um, we right now are not doing propagating on site. We don't really have the facilities for that. Keeping my fingers crossed, would love to see that at some point. Um, when I was able to visit Heritage over the summer, they have some new facilities there, including um, new greenhouse and propagation room. And that was something that was actually, um, a lot of the funding was from a Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust grant. So that's something that could, again, keeping our fingers crossed, could, something that we could do at Tyler at some point because it wouldn't just benefit the rhododendron collection, but we have a lot of wonderful collections, our magnolias, cherries, um, so on and so forth that we could definitely benefit from being able to do propagation in-house. Um, as of now, a lot of that gets sent to other gardens. When we were propagating our cedar of Lebanon that was sent out to Longwood, it was sent out to a bunch of different gardens and individuals to work on propagating. Um, but right now we don't do public sale of that, but our we do have a plant sale every year. Um, it's gotten a little bit shuffled because of the, the pandemic. We've changed a lot of the way that we do that, but we do have one in the spring um, and that, we do have um, ARS comes in for that and they do sell rhododendron and some of those potentially could be ones that were propagated from Tyler's plants. Um, and I always tell people, if you are interested in a specific plan, you're interested in cuttings, um, send me an email. I can get you the right forms. You do have to fill out a memorandum so that you're not propagating and selling that yourself. And so that the credit is given to Tyler for that plant and the records are still attached to it. But that is an op option. if someone specifically is interested in propagating, they want a specific plant or um, are interested in it for their garden or for research purposes, we do we do have the ability to, to make sure that you're able to get those. And again, I would have to go out there and assess the plan, determine whether or not it's healthy enough for, to take cuttings, um, but that that's definitely an option. So thank you for that question, good one. <laughs> so I believe you just answered this with this most previous uh, question, but let me know if if you didn't cover it all. Someone was asking, does Tyler sell any of their rhododendrons or azalea hybrids at their spring plant sale? You're saying because Tyler isn't necessarily propagating, it might be in the ARS plants that are being sold, but they aren't being specifically sold and marketed as um, Tyler rhododendrons. Exactly. So again, I highly recommend coming to our plant sale. We are super lucky that the ARS participates in that. 
Um, and again, there are some plants, they might not be Tyler specific, some of those plants you can only get there, but they're, they are selling plants that we do have um, examples of at Tyler. So I always tell people when they're, when they're looking at plants last year, I think it was um, rhododendron adenopodum was one that was being sold. And I was like, if you walk up into the native woodland walk right now and you go around this curve, you can see one blooming and you should totally buy this because they're so gorgeous. So I provide them a, a little bit of marketing there because I just love those plants. So again, it might not be specific to Tyler, but if you are interested in purchasing rhododendron, the ones that the ARS sells at our plant sale and at their own plant sales um, generally are pretty unique and aren't ones that you can get elsewhere in the trade. A lot of them are propagated by members and grown out by members and, you know, they're hardy, they're well kept and just gorgeous. Wonderful. So while we're still talking propagation, um, Linda Hartnett has commented here that the Philadelphia chapter of the ARS does propagate. So for those of you out there with questions about propagation, maybe the Philadelphia chapter might have a little bit more support for you too. Definitely. All right. A question here about, um, are there any mountain laurels in the Tyler collection or native azaleas? We do have both. Um, there's a decent collection of mountain laurels in the collection. Um, I could rattle off exactly where they are, but I don't think that'll be too helpful. But again, if you, um, are interested in that you can shoot me an email and I could I could get maps made for you so you could find them or I could show them to you in the collection um we do have we do have some pretty wonderful mountain laurels and then the native azaleas as well there is one section of the garden that we refer to as the native room so there are a lot of them there but there are others scattered um throughout the collection the Worcester rhododendron garden but also um Tyler's entire property so I'm always happy to point those out um a lot of them are early blooming so if you come out there in the spring um, a lot of our native azaleas have really wonderful scent, which is one of my favorite things in any plant. Um, highly recommend coming out to see those bloom and the flowers themselves are just gorgeous. So we love our native azaleas. <laughs> we feel you on that. Jenkins loves native plants as well. Oh yeah. That's and perfect plug here. Let's talk about Jenkins as well. Um, I think it's perfect during the rhododendron bloom season. So right around Mother's Day-ish, highly recommend hit Tyler, hit Jenkins. Um, Jenkins collections of native azaleas are incredible, evergreen azaleas as well. Um, just take yourself on a little trek, pack a picnic, bring your mm -hmm. sketchbook, do some watercolors. It's just gorgeous. Um, Olivia, are you going to be doing uh, tours of the uh, rhododendron uh, collection again this year during the uh, bloom season? Yeah, so last year I did two tours during the bloom season, so two tours in May. Um, this year, hopefully I'll be able to do a little bit more than that. Um, but usually depending on the day, I would have about 10 or 12 people, which during the pandemic felt very safe. We could keep our distance from one another, wear masks if we were close to one another, but they're about an hour long. And I just basically give you the same spiel that I just gave you, but I get to point out specific plants as we wander along. Um, and that's another one. If you're really interested, every tour is a little different because different things are in bloom. So if you've ever wanted just a little bit. Uh, more information on Tyler's plants. Highly recommend coming out for those tours. Wonderful. All right, everybody, last chance questions for Olivia. Otherwise, we're going to wrap things up. So uh, I did press record today. Um, so yay. Uh, so hopefully we will have this recording available. And those of you who registered and I have your email addresses, I will, uh, once we have it processed and ready, I can send that out to the group who I had on the list today. Oh, looks like maybe we got one more. When do volunteers start working at Tyler? That is another great question. So um, we have volunteers essentially year round. We take a little bit of a break around the holidays, but we have volunteers working. We had volunteers this past week, even though it was so cold. Um, love our volunteers again, I don't know what we would do without all of our volunteers at Tyler. We get so much more work done with them. Everyone brings their own expertise and their knowledge. Fabulous people. Um, if you are interested in volunteering, we our Hort team takes volunteers two days a week. So that's Tuesdays and Wednesdays from eight to 12. Um, we do take a break in the middle there. So you're not gonna freeze to death. Um, you have time to take a snack as well. Um, so we take those two days a week and that is a larger group that we get. And then we sort of separate you guys based on tasks um, signing up ahead of time, 
is something that we've added because of the pandemic. So you sign up on, I don't remember, it's SurveyMonkey or something like that. You're gonna sign up ahead of time for whatever task you wanna do, whether that's something with me, which is usually pulling out bittersweet or mulching or doing a task like that, or you could work with some of our other court staff. And then this coming year, we're looking to adding um, specific volunteers just for the rhododendron collection. So that would be, you'd be working with me and with the other volunteers for that garden. Um, and we're thinking of adding those on Thursdays. Okay, great. Final comment here from uh, Linda Titanich. She said she's retiring next week and plan on volunteering at both Tyler and Jenkins. She's a member at both. And Linda's daughter, Heather, was a intern at Tyler and was a fellow at Jenkins. So lots of love from the Titanich family. Thank you so much. All right. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. And Olivia, thank you. And Jerry, thank you. And hopefully we'll get to do this again soon. All yeah, right. Thank you so much. Let's see, Jerry. Thanks, back. thanks so much, uh, Amy, for putting this together. And Olivia for a fabulous presentation. Really, uh, really uh, enjoyed it. It was great. Thank you. <laughs> all right, everybody. Stay warm out there. <laughs> yeah, get ready for all that snow. Thank you again. Yes. All right. Bye, everybody.